Good day, everyone, and welcome to the season premiere, episode one of the HJC podcast. And unlike other episode ones in the history of film, this one will deliver. I'm your blog admin, Ryan, also your Saturday poster. Uh, I'm going to be joined by different co-hosts uh, every week, hopefully. Today, I have our, our longest tenured writer, Sean, with us. Hey, Sean. Hi, how's it going? Pretty good. And we also have one of our newest writers, Tuesday writer, Ben. How's it going, Ben? Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so what you're going to get on this podcast is uh, a little bit of Jersey news, but also this is a chance for us to delve into hockey news, branch out uh, what HJC is doing currently. Uh, so let's just jump right into it, and uh, we've gone through three three days of games so far, and I guess the theme of the first three days of the season is hat-tricks, hat-tricks all over the place. We had uh, Connor McDavid on Wednesday with a hat-trick, all three goals against the Flames. Wayne Simmons uh, with a hat-trick against the Sharks. Brandon Saad with a hat-trick against the Penguins. I think everyone scored in that game, though. And then, uh, just because I'm a Leafs fan, I'm going to throw Austin Matthews in there with three points in the opener against the Jets. 7-2 win for the Leafs. Uh, let's start with Connor McDavid. He seems uh, seems to be all over the media that he's actually faster, which I didn't think was possible. But uh, he scored all three goals for the Oilers. Not, didn't seem to me like any other the lines were doing anything. What did you guys think of McDavid's performance uh, on Wednesday? guess I'll start this off. It was really good. Um, he came out like he was the – like, and the, we've seen him now. This is his hey, – let's call this his third season. Yeah. This has been really, really his best start so far. Uh, this is sort of what we've been waiting for from him. But I do agree with you, Indy, that it is concerning – that the other lines don't really seem to be doing much. Well, it seems um, like they, I, they can have success, even if it's just the McDavid line scoring. I mean, the defense shut down Calgary, and what McDavid had four or five breakaways that game. So, really, I mean, yeah. if he's going, if, he, if he's going, it looks like the Oilers are going to be going. This is this is a pretty big wake up to the rest of the Pacific, I think. Um, with the exception of Anaheim, I don't think that there's a team that could. Take on if there wasn't our team, it's probably Calgary that can take on the Oilers for positioning. Uh, I don't see that really happening based on that. Now things could change, but this is this is encouraging if you're an Oilers fan. Yeah, Ben, did you get a chance to catch any of the Oilers Flames game? Uh, not this week. I would say though, um, I think it's not just the McDavid show out in Edmonton. I think uh, Cam Talbot is very much underrated. I think he's a huge part of the. Oilers' success lately, I would expect him to continue that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we also had uh, we also had Wayne Simmons score a hat trick. Uh, I think that was in San Jose, so I didn't catch that game because I was watching the Oilers game. Anybody catch any of that? And from what I hear, I'm not following the Flyers quite a lot, but uh, Wayne Simmons is someone that you'd want on your team. Anyone catch uh, Wayne Simmons Flyers game? I caught the highlights to it, and yes. Um... Simmons is an underrated guy in Philadelphia because they obviously have had Claude Giroux for longer, um, and statistically he has been a better player. But for a play, for a team right now in Philly that is on the outside looking in heavily in the standings, they're in a very tough division. For a playoff team, Simmons is the type of guy you want to make an offer for. I think that this is what we're going to see is that Simmons is going to make his worth known, and this is a good start to it. And he's going to need to step up with the departure of Braden Chen too. If, if the Flyers hope to go anywhere. Absolutely. Uh, so we also had uh, in the massacre, the 10-1 win by the Hawks. Brandon Saad got a hat trick. I don't know who, who – if you didn't get a hat trick in that game, you probably are getting sent to Rockford. Uh, who saw the game last night? Or, sorry, I guess that was on Thursday. Brandon Saad. Uh, ben, did you catch any of the highlights? Or just what do you think of the Hawks team this year? Not sure what to think of them. It's like – Men of my boys out there. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the Hawks, they had the uh, top seed in the West last year, and then they went down uh, very unexpectedly to, you know, the eventual Western Conference champion. So I wonder if that's that's what's driving them, uh, especially in that uh, game against the defending cup champions. Yeah, well, they have a lot of changeover. I think it's in their bottom six forwards where a lot of the changeover comes and they, you know, they brought back Saad. They brought back Sharp. It seems that they're going back to what worked with with their cup wins. And why not? Why wouldn't they? I'm just worried personally that uh, perhaps they're 
going back to a well that's now dry. I mean, the season still has to play out. And they just won 10-1 against the defending Stanley Cup champions. But, uh, Jets, just what you've seen from Chicago in that first game, 10-1. I mean, what can what oh, else I'm can you say? Oh, I'm not buying this. No, I am very skeptical of this Hawks team so far. Uh, again, they're another team that's in a tough division, but I do not, you know, bringing Sod back, I think was a good idea. Sharp, I do not, but I agree with you in the, these are players that, you know, five years ago were some of the best in the NHL, but these don't have, the, these players don't have the same value they once did, which is why they, the Hawks were able to get them back. And uh, goaltending, I think is going to be an issue. Not the Corey Crawford's at the point now where he can't start, but who are they going to bring in to start if he can't? They've gotten rid of Valenti Rana. They've gotten rid of um, Scott Darling. Who is um, their backup this year? I mean, exactly. Okay. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, I, I, not as impressive, but Austin Matthews did have three points in their in the Leafs opener. They did defeat the Jets 7-2. to two. Um, Just on the winning side of things, from my perspective, um, yes, the Leafs did score seven, but Freddie Anderson, the goalie, did keep them in in the first period. Without him, it's not a 7-2 to two win. And the Leafs still haven't proven. They've proven definitely that they are an offensive threat and they might be able to outscore their mistakes. But they have yet to prove that they're a better defensive team than last year. And that was one of the issues that people seem to be ignoring here in Toronto because of all the optimism. Now, as far as uh, Jets, you're obviously a Jets fan. Uh <laughs> I mean, I was questionable about their goaltending tandem, and it kind of reared its head in the opener. Uh, what What was your view of that game? I, I think that outside of goaltending, the Leafs and Jets are pretty evenly matched. They can score a lot. I think that the Jets may have a slight edge in defense, maybe, but the goal to, this really shows how good of an acquisition uh, Freddie Anderson has been for the team. I'm not going to say right now that Steve Mason was a terrible pickup, but the guys that were available, there were better choices for them. And this was a night where it's, that, that Steve Mason, who is wildly inconsistent, admittedly, needed to be on a good swing because there are a lot of teams like Toronto that do score a lot. On the other hand, on the Leafs' defense, yeah, I, I, I think that you know with the high scoring, the, they might just go for the type of team that they're going to every game is going to be a 7-5 win or something along the lines of that. I didn't see the least defense as particularly terrible, but it wasn't great either. And uh, that's not something you can do if they want to be the second-round, third-round team that they want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ben, from a view from uh, the other side of the league, I would say, or outside of a Leafs and Winnipeg market, what's your view of the Leafs? Uh, how close maybe are they? And likewise with the Jets. Are, are, are they right on par there with the Leafs? Um. Yeah, I would say the Leafs, with all those years in the dwelling in the cellar, uh, really built up their forwards through the draft. Um, I think it's good that they know their strengths. They they use them to try to compensate for their weaknesses. Um, not sure about the Jets, though. They always seem to be one of those teams that are sort of uh, 500 every year, maybe make the playoffs, maybe don't. Really nothing uh, spectacular about them, kind of like uh, – my Red Wings the uh, past few seasons sort of getting into the first round and then uh, making a quick exit after that. Well, they did take out Minnesota in their first game, so that's uh, that's ex- exciting because if, if I'm picking one of the teams to finish 31st, for me, Detroit's right in that pack there because they seem to want to do a rebuild on the fly, not commit to a full teardown. But what's your view of the, of the Red Wings this year? Uh, I'm disappointed to say the least. Um, let's look at their off-season moves. What they do? They signed a veteran defenseman. Yep. Don't sign a de- veteran defenseman in a rebuild. Yeah. And then, most disappointing of all, we still don't have Anthony Sioux back. Yeah, it's, and he's on his way like, to Switzerland, I believe, now. To at least skate. Who knows at this point. To at least skate with the team there. So the Wings, uh, they're clearly in a turnover stage. I don't think they know what stage they're in right now. Um, no. l- let's move on to uh, Yarmir Yager signing in Calgary. One year, $1 million deal. Uh, also a $1 million in possible bonuses. Uh, I think it was Pierre Lebrun of the, the Athletic and TSN who was reporting heavily on this. St. Louis made a comparable offer, apparently. Calgary came in with their offer. 
Yager chooses Calgary. Um, how do we see Yager doing in Calgary? Is this going to make a difference? Uh, ben, thoughts on Yager in Calgary? I, th- I think I can speak for every fan in the NHL that I'm glad Yager's back. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's always fun to watch him on and off the ice. I mean, I saw a picture of him, his first skate with the Flames. He's in his workout gear, shorts and a T-shirt, threw on some skates, decides to get out on the ice. I know he's been doing that for years, but that's the first uh, the first Calgary fans saw of him on the ice, his shorts and a T-shirt and he's skating around. Uh, Sean, what you what do you think of uh, Yager and Calgary? I, I think that uh, amongst the Army Yager fans, I'm one of the bigger ones. I'm glad he's on an NHL team. I think he picked the right team. This is a team with a lot of youth and a lot of experience, and the experience they do bring in tends not to be the best. So this, this I like. I, I get why he wouldn't want to go to St. Louis, because in St. Louis he had a hole to fill. And I think that it, the Blues taking Scotty Upshaw as a number two Let's see, he's a guy who knows the St. Louis system. He knows everything. Yager is, would be a completely new thing. And Yager's at a point in his career now where he has nothing to lose by telling a team, no, I don't want to play for you. He's in arguably the easiest division in the NHL. Um, why not get to the second round of the playoffs maybe? You know, go out on a high street. I do see problems, though, with Yager. How old is he? Mid-40s we're talking now? 45. Yeah, yeah. and he's missed a preseason. Now, we've seen what... You go back as far as 10 years ago, we look at Matt Sundin missing uh, three months of a season, finally joins Vancouver, and it was clear that he was a step behind everyone else. Now, everyone else has had a preseason, and then you bring in Yager. At 45, how long does it take you to catch up to a bunch of 20-year-olds, mid-20-year-olds? So that's my concern there. Is the Calgary team too fast for Yager? As much as I want to see Yarmir Yager in the NHL, has the NHL bypassed Yarmir Yager? That's my question. And only time will tell on that one. Um, Let's move. Stick in Alberta. Let's move to the Oilers. Uh, Don't know how to say his first name. Kyer? Kyer? Kaler. Kaler Yamamoto. Sorry for butchering butchering his name. I know he's listening to the podcast, so I just want to say sorry for butchering your name. Anyways, he makes the opening night roster. He only played six and a half minutes against Calgary, and that was three minutes less than the second uh, least ice time guy, Mark Latestu. They do have eight games left now to make a choice. Uh, do we think he stays with the team or after having six and a half minutes of ice time in the home opener in which they won three, nothing. Does it look like this guy sticking around in Edmonton? Ben? Um, it might be hard to tell hard, especially with, you know, six minutes of ice time. You know, maybe in future games he could be up maybe around uh, 8 or 10, and then the uh, Oilers management could uh, uh, get a better idea of what he can do there. Yeah, it was. He, so, I don't know if he really even got a chance with six minutes of ice time. I don't know if there was something that the coach didn't like or if it was just easing him into the situation, you know? Might just be because he's the last guy to make the roster. Uh, you're not going to play, you know, all 18 skaters equally in a game. You're going to play your, you know, top two lines. Uh, more often than not. And as we talked about, McDavid was flying that night, so why not get him on the ice for 20 minutes? Sean, uh, is Yamamoto sticking around with the Oilers? If they're going to make that decision, they're they they they're going to make it soon. They decided with Pulley RV to send him down, and he was their top draft pick the year before. So they're not afraid to send top draft picks to the AHL, which is good. We've seen with guys like Kadri and Shifley that AHL experience is good for young players. But if he is going to get NHL experience, he needs to be put on the ice. I feel like it'll be within the next three to four games. We'll find this out. But I I, I have faith in the Edmonton uh, management that they know what they're doing. Yeah, I think, I mean, six and a half minutes of ice time. It's hard to decide how he was doing out there. I was trying to get an eye on him watching the game, but just couldn't get a feel because he wasn't out there enough. And it was the Connor McDavid show. And you don't need your other guys to be great if McDavid is going to own the game like he did, which he's going to maybe 40 or 50 times a season this year. But it'll be interesting. I think he'll go back. Where I think he plays in Spokane. But uh, I think he'll go back. They'll take the nine games. Just give him a taste. He'll go back, uh, be exceptional in junior this year. And then uh, he'll be back next year and a big part of the team. Uh, the... 
person in charge of that decision, Peter Shirelli, I just wanted to go back a couple of years. Anybody remember when Peter Shirelli had that terrible, terrible mustache going? Uh, it looked, he looked like he drived a van with blacked out windows and was hanging around playgrounds. I don't know if you guys remember. When... Yes. That was when Boston started slipping from the top four teams in the NHL to the middle of the road team we have now. And when he departed, yeah, that was, if that was a sign of things to come for the Boston roster, then it was very obvious. <laughs> well, I'm glad he's gone full beard now. So, you know, that his choice of facial hair heavily impacts the Oilers roster. <laughs> uh, let's move ahead to uh, let's go to Dallas and uh, their their broadcaster Dave Strader passed away of cancer October first. Uh, I never listened to a Dallas Stars broadcast, but uh, I became familiar with his work, learning learning about it from all the tributes, and it just seems like a lot of people uh, respected this guy, well respected announcer. I didn't realize uh, he did work with the Detroit Red Wings too, and uh, he's done national work with NBC. Uh, just I, have you guys heard uh, Dave Strader call a game? Maybe any thoughts about it? Uh, what 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 would you like to say on this topic? I think it's interesting because I grew up in uh, Big Rapids, Michigan, which is uh, very much the Red Wings market, and I've never heard of him until his passing. So mm-hmm. um, I think it also speaks to how widely he was known around the league. He was with several teams, and as you mentioned, he was doing uh, national broadcasts. So. Um, uh, passing like this definitely hits a little harder than uh, some of the other uh, people in the game. Yeah, well, Doc Emmerich on uh, NBC's Wednesday night broadcast did a really nice tribute that I caught on Twitter, so that was pretty good. I don't know, Jets, did you catch any of Dave Strader's calls, or were you familiar with him a little bit? Or I knew of the name. Uh, I may have caught it in passing through highlights and stuff like that. Um, I think it's 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 something where this is nice to see with regards to the fact that this is a guy who was Dallas. Because one thing that I think many people will have a critique of the Stars is that a lot of their their well known names came from Minnesota. This is someone who was exclusively known for being most recently with Dallas, and I think most famously with Dallas as well. We can say. Um, unless you know someone wants to come to the eighty to the pre dynasty Red Wings perspective, but yeah, it, it, you know this is it, he came in at a, at a time now where the Stars are one of the most exciting teams in the league, and he was the voice to that. Yeah, absolutely, and it's great to see when a guy can stick around a team for long enough, like Dave Strader, uh, that the Stars are actually going to wear a memorial decal on their helmet. It's a microphone logo with a DS at the bottom. It was actually covered on uh, Friday's, one of Friday's posts, which actually brings me to another piece of news, a little bit of how the new HJC is going to operate. We still have our concept posts uh, coming out every day, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, but we're also going to try and cover some news. Uh, I know some of our writers want to share some stories. Uh, We're definitely going to be reviewing some of the Adidas merchandise, uh, regretfully, some of us want to get our hands on a Fanatics jersey and take a look at that piece of crap, and we'll throw up a video on YouTube, and maybe we'll get something up on the blog. But you can expect to see a lot more content on HJC. And also, uh, we've heard uh, all your complaints about how the blog looks, and of course, we're going to fix that. And I would especially like to thank Burka Circus for being the most constructive of all of them who have contributed to the look of the blog. Thank you, Berkus, and we will take your comments very seriously, and we hope that we can please you in the future. Moving on, let's go to uh, division winners. Um, Let's start in the Atlantic. Uh, That's uh, that's Toronto, Tampa Bay, Florida, Montreal, blah, 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 Florida, Boston, et cetera, Buffalo. Uh, I got Tampa Bay winning this division. if they stay healthy, and of course all these predictions are based on health, but Stamkos is back. Kucherov is there. They have a fantastic defense. Uh, Vasilyevsky in net. Almost forgot his name there. I picked Tampa Bay to win the Atlantic. Jets, who you got to win the Atlantic this year? I, too, have Tampa. Um, it's Stamkos is a good point. The goaltending is consistent goaltending, too, because they have turned out to be the big winners in the Bishop Budai trade because now they have someone – Vasilevsky can look at and go, there's a guy who you can study under. If they are not healthy, though, the two Ontario teams are dangerous. Absolutely. The, they're going to be two and three, and they're going to be neck and neck. So, you know, we could be mid-April, and it, surprisingly, the Senators are going to be winning that division. 
It's all about which of those three teams stays healthiest, but it's supposing all three are healthy. It's Tampa's division to lose. Ben, how about you? Uh, I got to go with Montreal again. Um, I think especially with this, uh, just how uh, crazy the season started with all these goals, I think goaltending is uh, more important than ever right now. And uh, I think Carey Price is still one of the best. Ah, I think uh, Canadians win on the strength of him. He is the wild card for the Canadians. He can just all of a sudden become all world, a brick wall, and all of a sudden the Canadians can finish with 105 points again. Uh, Let's move to uh, stay in the Eastern Conference. We'll move to the Metro Division. This one's a tough one for me. I like Pittsburgh. I like the Rangers, but I chose Columbus. Uh, They're just a strong team. I don't know why, but they seem to rally uh, around Tortorella. Uh, you got to like their goaltending, Bobrovsky. Excuse me. Bet, uh, ben, what do you think of the Metro this year? Who do you like? Uh, i got to go with Columbus as well. Just thinking back to last year, that you know, crazy long win streak. I think uh, it takes a really special team to do something like that. I uh, kept a lot of those parts. I, I think Columbus comes out on top this year. And I, th- I think they got something to play for. They probably felt unsatisfied with the result last year, so I think they got something to play for. And you know they'd love to win, love to win a playoff series. Sean, who you got for the Metro? I'm going to say Pittsburgh, but only based on whichever team wins the most games between the two of them. Pittsburgh and Columbus. They, exactly. They are good enough where they can beat every team in that division. Whichever team between one of them comes out winning the season series wins the division. All right. Uh, moving over to the Western Conference. We got the Central Division, one of the toughest divisions, if not the toughest division in hockey. Again, another tough pick. I don't like St. Louis because of the injuries. Uh, Nashville just seems to always cruise into the playoffs, never really take it by storm. Dallas, I'm not convinced that a team can make that many changes and win the division in the same year, although it can be done. Uh, So I had no choice. I went with Chicago on this one. How about you, Sean? As I said, I, I don't even know if I see Chicago making the playoffs this year, let alone winning the division. I'm going out on a limb and supposing that if Nashville's injuries return and we see the growth in the youth that we saw in the playoffs continue, they, it's they're, they're going to win the division. But supposing all that doesn't happen, I got Minnesota. That goal, Devin Dubnik is such a good goaltender, and that defense is so shut down that, that um, they're going to be dangerous. And where do you see your team Winnipeg finishing? Fourth or fifth, they will be uh, one of the wild card teams. Okay. Uh, Ben, this is kind of also your division too. Who do you like in the Central? Uh, I got to go with Minnesota as well, just the reason uh, Jets mentioned. Dubnik, defense, um, I just think that's really going to be key this year. Minnesota does that as well, just about as well as anybody. Absolutely. Honest assessment of your Detroit Red Wings, where do they finish this year? Uh, Best case scenario and worst case scenario. Uh, best case scenario, um, all the forwards and uh, Mrazek go back to their uh, last year levels and uh, just go on a tear. Um, I could see them maybe taking a wild card spot, best case scenario. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, they finish above Vegas. I mean, they, uh, there's a, the floor is very low this year, just uh, based on the trajectory of the past few years. Yeah, it could be a tough year in Detroit, frankly. Uh, And our final division, let's move to the Pacific Division. After watching the game on Wednesday, I have no choice but to take the Edmonton Oilers and Connor McDavid for this division. Uh, Ben, who you got for the Pacific? I have to go with Edmonton as well. It's uh, not just the Connor McDavid show. It's uh, Cam Talbot as well. Um, Maybe you can tell by now, but uh, I think goaltending is really crucial for some of these teams. I think Cam Talbot can uh, take his team deep in the playoffs yep sean how about you i i'm gonna make it a unanimous pick uh edmonton wins the division their defense is decent enough now that they can do this if mcdavid has an off night i would assume until proven otherwise that their scoring is good enough they can fill that in and cam talbot is proven to be worthy anaheim is good enough to win but this is the i think it's the weakest division in hockey so i could see edmonton sweeping the season series with every team under anaheim and just, you know, making possibly a President's Trophies run with just how easy the schedule is going to be. Yeah, a lot of love uh, coming Edmonton's way. Anaheim is uh, certainly a possibility out there. I don't like L.A. I don't like San Jose. They seem to be trending downward. 
So, I mean, we'll see. We'll talk about this again in April and see where all these teams are, and we'll come back to episode one of the HJC podcast. Let's move on to a feature that we hope to have every week here on the HJC podcast called the HJC Mailbag. And you can write in, email in, uh, send us in questions on Twitter, Facebook, comments on the blog, whatever you want. You can ask us about jerseys. You can ask us about hockey. You can ask us about your love life. You can ask us about your mother. Whatever you want, send any questions you have to HJC and the group of writers that we have that week will answer your questions. So let's hit it. Here comes HJC Mailbag. 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 All right, and the first mailbag question actually comes from our very own Winnipeg Jets 96. Jets 96. Sean, go ahead. What's your question? My question writes, Dear Ryan, you are so cool and awesome. Thank you. I have to wash a jersey. How do I do it? Do I put it in the dryer? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop you right there. First off, thanks for the question. You have very lovely handwriting. Um, (laughs) My personal opinion, and this is the part where you go, ew, gross, is don't wash your jerseys. However, sometimes you go to the game and you've had a delicious hot dog. And you've spilled mustard on yourself, and you have to wash that jersey. You put it in the washing machine, all by itself, inside out, cold water, gentle cycle. And when it's done, you do not dry it. You never dry it. Because the uh, heat sealing on all the crests and numbers is usually done uh, in a rush job. It's very cheap. It's, It's poorly done. And if you dry your jersey, there is a chance that it's going to start to bubble. And if you consistently dry your jersey, it will eventually fall off, as one of my jerseys did. Uh, the nameplate on the back a long time ago fell off. I had to take it back to the store and tell them to repress it. So my advice is never wash your jerseys. Keep them clean. Treat them like gold so that you never have to put them in the washing machine. And repeated washes over and over like a regular shirt or a pair of pants will destroy your jersey within a year. So do not wash your jerseys. That'll uh, that'll just about do it here on the initial episode of the HJC podcast. Jets, Ben, thanks for being a part of this. And we will see everyone again next Saturday for episode two. Take care, everyone.